So every other week, I do a Bible study over at Oakwood. And when I go over to Oakwood, I practice my message. So it's like a dry run on the sermon to see how it goes. And sometimes it goes really well. I think, yeah, this is going to this is going to work. Other times it's a complete train wreck and I think I've got to start over. Well, when I did uh, my sermon, I uh, practiced my sermon this week, a little bit of an argument broke out. And it wasn't a bad one. Uh, people weren't nasty to one another. But there were strong opinions um, on opposite sides of an issue. And it was good for me to see. Because it reminded me that today's topic has the potential to stir up uh, strong emotions. It also highlighted two different perspectives that live in tension with one another. Today's topic is what's up with Christians and the environment. And you can't talk about the environment without talking about global warming a little bit. And that is highly politicized. And people have strong feelings about it. So pastors have a decision to make when we come to issues like this. One is we could just avoid the issue and just stick with safe uh, topics that, that everyone is going to agree upon. That's one, that's one option. The other option is to pick a perspective based on the leaning of your congregation and find verses that support that perspective. Congregations love that. <clears throat> That goes over really well. Um, or you could pick the opposite side as the congregation and start looking for a new church. So those are the different options that pastors have when we come to topics uh, like this. Part of my philosophy of preaching is that whenever there is conflict in our culture, there is an opportunity for Christians. I, I think our culture longs to see people think carefully, communicate respectfully, and, and work toward coming up with common sense kinds of solutions. Um, so I want that to be the tone of this message, and I want that to be the, the spirit of this church, uh, that we're willing to wade into these issues, but that we do it with care and, and respect. Um, and and I, I come up with some ground rules that I think will, will help with this. So let me give you a couple ground rules for approaching uh, not just this topic, but topics like it. Number one, I think it's important when, when we deal with controversial topics, especially political to recognize the limits of what the Bible says. The, the Bible isn't a political manual that, that lays out, it's not a policy manual, that lays out exactly what we ought to do in all of these situations. As a matter of fact, it hardly ever does that. There are lots of important questions that the Bible doesn't answer, some that it doesn't even address. And, and I think that pastors overstep their bounds when they use the pulpit as an opportunity to force or to twist the Bible into reinforcing whatever their particular perspective is and, and spiritualizing how people ought to respond. One area where this has, where we've, where we've encountered this a lot, are our talks about immigration. That's an issue that I care very deeply about. I think the Bible is super clear that we are to love immigrants and treat them well, but the Bible doesn't say anything about how many immigrants ought to be accepted or, or let in every year. It doesn't address whether a wall is a good idea or, or a bad idea. So in all of those policy areas, godly people are going to disagree and sometimes disagree strongly. So one, we have to recognize the limits of what the Bible says and, and doesn't say. Second, we, we need to realize that um, there are often competing values that live in tension with one another. I did a ride-along with the um, Clark County Sheriff's Department, not this Friday, but the Friday before, because I serve on the Clark County Law Enforcement Advisory Team. We have to do two ride-alongs. And I, so I spent the whole evening riding with a sheriff's deputy. And part of the reason I'm on this team is because we want to make sure that, that, um, that um, there's a group that exists where people who are parts of um, different minorities have a say in policing standards. So I'm one of the token white guys on this, on this team. 
Um, but I, I care deeply about everything happening with the, the Black Lives Matter movement. I, I care about the loss of life. And I rode with the deputy, and we had a long conversation about what he called the thin blue line. Not, not the blue wall, which is when police form a wall to obstruct uh, things or hide things, but the thin blue line is a sense of camaraderie. And it, it's, it's a sense that, that people in law enforcement um, uh, deserve to be respected and need to be able to do their job safely. And it's a way of saying, I really value the lives of people who are in law enforcement. Well, I value both of those things. And sometimes there's a tension between them, and occasionally there will be conflicts where we have to side with one or the other. Um, but sometimes we just live in the middle of the tension, and we're pulled in two directions, and we have to kind of wrestle with that. I think that happens when we get to the, in, uh, the topic of the environment. Uh, one person who is involved in the, the exchange is a scientist who is very concerned that if we don't take drastic steps very quickly, we might reach a point where the damage is irreversible and so severe that it threatens human existence. That was one perspective and one value, and that's a, that's a, a good value. We ought to be concerned about that. The other person is from a state where there is a lot of poverty and there aren't enough good paying jobs and some efforts to save, to, to help the environment might cost jobs. And, and he's concerned about people in his state having an opportunity to, to earn an income and support their families and is afraid that there are some things we might do that would hurt people who are living in poverty and need work. Those are, those are great values and they, they live in tension with one another and, and they really butt heads in this area of talking about environmentalism. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I think as Christians we need to work on is we, we need to be willing to embrace complexity. We, we like simple answers that are black and white, and life often just isn't like that, is it? <laughs> but but there, there are these issues that are really, really complex and hard to understand, and I think we need to avoid just picking simple solutions because we like them, but be willing to li live with some of the com complexity. Um, and, th and then the last thing, last thing that I think helps us as we wade through these is recognizing that this is a debatable issue. And Paul gives some guidance for dealing with debatable issues, and it really comes down to, to two main things. When, when the Bible doesn't provide a clear answer, be firmly convic convinced in your own mind what is correct, but don't judge people who disagree with you. So those are some parameters for how I want to approach this. There's one more thing that I'm going to do to try to make this, to, to uh, protect myself from getting into trouble. I'm going to steal a trick from the Apostle Paul. So there's a case in the New Testament where Apostle Paul was addressing a, a sensitive, touchy, controversial topic. And it was the topic of whether, what conditions, uh, when could a person who was divorced get remarried? That's a tough, sensitive topic. So Paul did something, and I'm going to steal his trick. What Paul did is when he was talking about the topic, he said, here's what Jesus says. And there's a point where he says, now, wait a minute, this is just me talking here. This is just me talking. This is, I'm not quoting Jesus. I'm not sharing what he said. This is just my opinion. So I will try to be careful about that and stick for the most part to what, what Scripture is clear on. There are some things toward the end of the message where I'll say, this is just my opinion. This is my best sense of what's going on here. So let's, let's get into our topic. The big idea for today's message is that God has made us stewards over creation, calling us to both use and protect it. I think that Christians should be among those most concerned with protecting our environment. I'm going to share some principles for, for why I think that is. But before I do that, I want to share kind of four kind of big uh, overarching principles about how we should think about the, the, the physical world and our environment. So I get these four kind of overarching principles before we get into things that are maybe a little bit more practical. First one is the world and, the, and its environment are God's creation. 
So whenever we're talking about creation care, talking about the environment, or how we treat the world, or how we treat the air, we're, we're talking about how we treat something that God created. And not just created, but created for us. Um, so that, that's the first principle. Creation care is about how we treat God's stuff. Um, so one image that was kind of in my mind as I was thinking about this message is, is if, someone, if someone created a gift, they, if they went and they made a gift for you, maybe they made a piece of furniture or, or they labored over it and then they gave it to someone and if we saw that person kind of trashing the gift, scratching it, kicking it, breaking it, uh, we would recognize that's just not, that's just wrong. <laughs> you just don't do that. And same is the case when it comes to being careless about taking care of the world that we're in. Here's the next overarching principle. <clears throat> the world and its environment are under a curse. Uh, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 through 18, there's a case where it talks about God pronouncing a curse. He's talking about the effects of sin and, and the, all the different areas where sin is going to take a toll on the world. And it takes a toll on, on life. It takes a toll on relationships. It takes a toll on marriage. And it takes a toll on the earth. All of a sudden, weeds started to grow. And all of a sudden, everything started to break down. So, so I think this lines up with what science teaches us. There's a, I'm not a big scientist. Um, but the, the second law of thermodynamics says that everything is breaking down. That if you, if you just leave something long enough, it will start to, to break down. And that's certainly happening in our world, and it is the result of, of uh, the, the toll of sin. Third thing is that the world and its environment is one day going to be destroyed. The world that we are in is a temporary world. In um, <clears throat> Psalm 102, it says, In the beginning you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. But the next verse reads, they will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment. Uh, Christ himself in Luke chapter 21 said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. There's a passage in 2 Peter where Peter is talking about the second coming of Christ. And Peter wrote, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. So the earth will one day um, wear out. The earth and the environment will one day pass away. The earth and the environment will one day uh, be laid bare, and our response is to live holy and godly lives. Um, and then there's one, there's one last uh, kind of overarching uh, principle that I want to hit. And that is, and this is a good one because that sounded kind of dark. Here's a good one. The world and the environment will one day be renewed. So the, the whole story of the Bible is that, that sin is taking its toll on everything. Everything is breaking down. But God didn't give up on us. And he didn't give up on creation. He's going to renew it. He's going to renew it, not just to its original state, but to an even better state. So that's what we look, look forward to. We love watching uh, those home improvement shows. So we, we like watching uh, This Old House and Chip and Joanna and uh, Hometown. I think it's uh, Ben and Aaron. But we watch those all the time. And I can't, there are a number of times we've said, man, wouldn't it be great? If this whole house would just show up and like renovate everything, and and or what wouldn't it be great if Chip and Joanna would come? I mean, she has such great taste and just like decorated her house for us. Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, well the story of, of the Bible is even better than that because the story of the Bible is that Jesus is going to show up and is going to renew all things, including the world and the environment. I love the language <clears throat> that Jesus uses to refer to the second coming in Matthew 19, 28. 
Jesus is talking about the second coming, and he calls it the renewal of all things. That's the name that he gives to the second coming. I'm going to come back, and what it's going to be, it's going to be the renewal of all things. In Romans 8, 19 through 21, Paul tells us, creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. In the book of Revelations 21, verse 1, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So those, those are some overguiding principles. And here's the thing. We live in, in, in a world that is in between. We live in between this time when God created a perfect world and the time when God is going, when Christ is going to come back and renew a perfect world. We live in a messed up world <laughs> in, in between those two, those two times and we need to figure out how ought we to live. So I want to share a few principles now for why Christians should care about the environment. And I want to start by addressing one possible reaction that could occur to a sermon like this. So one possible reaction would be, oh no, this is just more liberal, politically correct stuff. This is just the latest liberal, politically correct stuff kind of, kind of hashed over and turned into a, a sermon. Uh, not so. Um, the, the current call for Christians to, to view protecting the environment, and a term that I'm going to use is creation care, as part of our spiritual calling goes all the way back, at, at least in, in current times, to a movement that was started by two people named Billy Graham and John Stott. And in 1974, they called 2,400 Christian leaders to, to gather together in a place called Luzon, Switzerland, and to come up with a plan for evangelizing the world. What does it take for us to reach the world for Christ? And then they agreed to continue meeting every year to find ways that we can partner together on that. And they met, uh, the following year, they met in Cape Town, South Africa. Or excuse me, this was in 2010. A number of years went by. 2010, they met in Cape Town, South Africa. And they, they produced a document called the Cape Town Commitment. It's a number of commitments they were calling Christians to. And one was called the Luzon Creation Care Commitment. Let me read this for you. <clears throat> what they said is if Christ is Lord of all the earth, we cannot separate our responsibility to Christ from how we act in relation to the earth. For to proclaim the gospel that says Jesus is Lord is to proclaim the gospel that includes the earth, since Christ's lordship is over all creation. Creation care is thus a gospel issue under the lordship of Jesus Christ. So, so this is not just the latest idea that, that I'm rolling out because some people think it's important. There's a long history. I'm going to share another quotation. It goes all the way back to the 1500s um, of a Christian leader commenting on this here in a little bit. But, but why should Christians care about the environment? Here's the first reason. Because we love its creator. This goes back to that idea of the creator giving us a gift and then how, how rude and inappropriate it would be if we, we turned around and just like smashed it and trashed it right in front of him. Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and he established it on the waters. So we care about what happens to creation because God cares about it. Uh, we care about it because trashing the environment is trashing something that God made. Um, and for that reason, um, this should be an important issue to us as Christians. Um, here's, here's the next reason. So first of all, God, we, we, we care about the world and the environment because we love its creator. Second, we care about the world and the environment because God put us in charge of it. In Genesis 1 verse 28, this is a passage that's called the creation mandate. And it's a, it's a time right after creation when God gave a mandate to Adam and Eve. And it says, God blessed them, <clears throat> and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over it, 
over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. In Genesis 2, 15, uh, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. In Psalm 8, verse 6, it says, the psalmist wrote, What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and you put everything under their feet. So God put us in charge of taking care of his creation. And this reminds me of the parable that Jesus told about the tenant farmers. Remember that parable where there are these farmers and there's a vineyard and the, the owner of the vineyard puts them in charge of it and then he goes away for a while and he comes back and it doesn't go well um, because they have not taken care of it and, and they don't respect him. But the same kind of thing is, exists with, with creation care. Is God has put us in charge of it and it's our job to take care of it um, uh, in, in the meantime. And this, this idea goes way back. This idea goes back um, all the way to a person who wrote in the, the 16th century, the 1500s, named John uh, Calvin. A uh, uh, dashing looking guy up there. And he wrote, <clears throat> this is what Calvin wrote in the 1500s. Let him who possesses a field so partake of its yearly fruits that he may not suffer the ground to be injured by his negligence. Let him endeavor to hand it down to posterity as he received it, or even better, let him so feed on its fruits that he neither dissipates it by, by luxury nor permits it to be marred by neglect. Moreover, let everyone regard himself as the steward of God in all things which he possesses. So this idea of stewardship is not a new one. It's one that the church leaders throughout church history have recognized. Here's another reason why we ought to care for the world and the environment. Because we love, it's our most vulnerable neighbors. Another reason to care for the world is because we love people who are vulnerable and poor people tend to live in the areas that are most susceptible to environmental decay. If you look at some of the, the predictions of, of global warming and things that could happen as a result of that, uh, there are many countries where people live basically very close to sea level and are in great, in great danger should that happen. It's a guy named Leith Anderson. He's the president of a group called the National Association of Evangelicals. And they wrote a document called Loving the Least of These, Addressing a Changing in Environment. So let me read what this person said, um, who is a, a leader among evangelicals. Leith Anderson said, While others debate the science of climate change, my thoughts go to the poor people who are neither scientists nor politicians. They will never study carbon dioxide or the acidification of the ocean, but they will suffer from dry wells in the deserts of Africa and floods along the coast of Bangladesh. Their crops will fail while our supermarkets are full. They will suffer while we study. That's the third reason why we ought to care is many of us uh, live in ways where, where we, we can buffer the effects of damage to the environment or, or climate change. We can turn up the air conditioning. There, there are millions and millions of people who can't do that. And, and they live in areas where they will be deeply affected should things uh, go the way some scientists think that they, they might. Then the fourth reason is because it affects our witness to the world. The world watches how we behave as Christians, and sometimes we behave poorly. <laughs> and when people look and see that we are taking careful care of the world because we love its creator, that is a positive testimony. So those are, those are some reasons why we should care about the world and its environment. Now, what, what do we do? Now, when we get to the what do we do part, this is where we have to move a little bit away from thus saith the Lord to thus saith Pastor Carl. Because there aren't Bible verses to, to support these. Well, there's, there's for uh, one. Um, but these are ideas, and most of these I've taken out of those two documents. Most of these ideas I've borrowed 
from the, uh, the, the document that the National Association of Evangelicals produced or the Luzanne uh, creation mandate, the document that was produced by that group. That's where these ideas come from. So here, here's the first thing. We need to pray for wisdom and discernment. You're going to hear all kinds of things on opposite ends of, about this area of, of the environment, particularly as it gets to, to global warming and climate change. Um, so we need to pray that God will help us to be wise and discerning in sorting through all of these voices that, that we're hearing. And so, so pay careful to where you get your information because um, there will be people on both sides who have agendas who will, tilt the, who will try to tilt the facts their way. So you really have to think carefully. So one, one piece of advice um, uh, that I saw goes with my next point. The next point in, the, in my list of what to do is listen to science. Um, some Christians have a lack of respect for, for science. And, and I think where it comes from is I think it, part of it comes all the way back to the, the, the battle for the Bible that occurred um, when there were, when there were battles over evolution and um, the, the, the trials down in, in Tennessee. So there was, an, there was an estrangement between faith and science that kind of occurred during that time, and many Christians are skeptical of it. And I, I think at the heart of this, there are some who fear that, that science may disprove our, our faith, and that's why they're afraid of science. I don't think that's ever going to happen because all truth comes from, from God. So truth, whether we discover it in science or whether we discover it in the Bible, is going to line up because it has the same author. And if it doesn't line up, we're either misunderstanding the Bible and we need to work harder in that area, or we're misunderstanding the science and need to look more closely there. We need to listen to the science. And one, one suggestion that, that, that uh, these groups said is instead of listening to one science, one scientist, try to identify some, some organizations that have lots of scientists in them and, and the statements that, that they produce. And, you know, fi find groups that have Republicans and Democrats and people on the right and people on the left in them. And, and what does that body of, of scientists have to say? Um, that was one uh, suggestion that they, that they had. Um, here, here's... Um, <clears throat> Here's, this is a thus saith Carl part of the message. But, but in terms of listening to the scientists, one, one of the issues is is, is, is global warming taking place? And there, there are a couple of issues there. One, is it, is it just short-term change or is it a part of a longer cycle? So that's, that's one thing. And from, from my trying to read the science as well as I can read it, it looks like it's happening. It looks like there's significant climate change happening. Now, the areas where there are, is debate is how much is human activity contributing to this? Are these just normal cycles that climates go through, um, or is human activity con contributing to it? And I, I believe that it, it is. Some of you may look at science and come to other conclusions. I've come to the conclusion that, yeah, I think, I think it probably is. It may not be the, the, the thing that's having the most effect, but one, um, it, it's the only thing we have control of. <laughs> so if there, if there are other factors that are affecting climate change, the only one we have any, can influence is human behavior. So if we're going to do anything, that's, that's kind of where we have to, to do that. And that, again, is where this tension comes up that I referred to at the beginning of, of the message, is there's tension between the impact that we'll have on jobs and what do we do, and that's where a lot of discernment is, is needed. The next thing we need to do is just take care of the earth. We ought to be known for taking care of the earth. I have, I have four quick suggestions that I'm going to give here as I, I close this sermon. One is we need to live more simply. Having stuff takes energy and depletes resources. And we ought to just be content with less stuff. We, we live in a culture that consumes a lot. Uh, we, we just consume lots and lots and lots of stuff and then we throw away lots and lots and lots of stuff. So one thing we can do is just adopt a more simple lifestyle that involves not consuming as much. Um, second thing is to make less trash. Uh, the average person uh, produces five pounds of trash uh, per day. So um, 
that, that assumes that sometimes we trash large things that weigh an awful lot. Um, and I'm sure you'll find other statistics provided by other people. That's just, I, I Googled and that's the first one that came up. Um, so we, we produce a lot of trash. We throw away a lot of stuff, so we should produce less trash. So um, one thing that we have an elders meeting this week, and one thing that I'm going to ask our board of elders to do is, is to commission a, a study of, of just how we use our energy here. And are there things that we're doing that are irresponsible and, and, and not, uh, not good for our environment? Like one thing I noticed is we use lots and lots of styrofoam. And styrofoams, there are other products that are less damaging to the environment, so maybe we should use something else. Maybe more often when we do church functions, we should try to use stuff that we can wash and, and, and reuse. But I want us to look at that and see, are there ways that we can just make less trash? Uh, use less energy. Um, another thing we need to look at, are we, are we using energy responsibly uh, as individuals and as a, as a church? And then last of all, support good policy. It, it, it's great to recycle. Recycling can make a little bit of a difference. <clears throat> but if we recycle and then elect people or support policy that is very damaging to the environment, our recycling isn't going to make all that much difference. So this is, again, where discernment is necessary. So study the issue, pray for discernment, get the best information that you can, and then support policies that, that, that take care of the world that God has, has given us. Hey, thank you so much for being willing to, to look at issues like this. We have two more sermons in this series and I'm going to be glad to move on to easier topics to, to address. So we have someone asked a question, what does the Bible teach about capitalism and socialism? That's a tough issue. And the toughest one of all, uh, from my perspective, was what does the Bible say about transgender people? So we're going to look at both of those topics in, in coming weeks. Then I'm going to do a series about how to approach the Bible. I'm really looking forward to that series. And then another series is coming up where we're going to study the lives of, of women in the Bible. Just kind of where we're going together in our study as a church. Uh, thank you for being willing to think about this topic with me. And let me say a prayer as the praise band uh, comes up and gets ready to, to lead us in a song, prepare our hearts for communion. Uh, Father, um, thank you for the beautiful world that we live in. Lord, I thank you for the majesty of creation. And many of us, e even just driving to church this morning, uh, observe the beauty that you have placed around us, and we are grateful for it, and we thank you for it. Father, I pray that you would help Christians to be wise, help us to have discernment, help us to set a good example for the world that is watching, help us to take responsibility, to care for people who have uh, less than we do. Um, Lord, most of all, I pray that you would help us to... Uh, Lord, be more grateful for what you've given us and, and to use the beauty of the environment to draw us into praise and worship of our great creator. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.